All right, so, oh, ooh, I have a touch screen, look at that. Um, the second talk I'm gonna do today is going to focus entirely on one icon, which is basically the, the idea that mutations plus natural selection equals evolution. And so I'm going to discuss the concept of genetic entropy. There's an entire book over on our table over there called Genetic Entropy by Dr. John Sanford. If you have somebody who's really into genetics, who's really into biology, who's really into science, this is a very good, solid scientific argument to talk through with them. It is probably the weakest point of evolution theory um, because a lot of the fossil record evidence we talked about before, you know, is it's hard to interpret things that happened in the past and make a conclusion about what happened there. It's not the same as actual empirical science that you can do under controlled conditions in the laboratory. So we're gonna look at stuff that's it's, um, more high confidence science in this presentation than we looked at in the last presentation. So I'm gonna skip my introductory slide because I already did that. And we're gonna talk about how evolution is supposed to work for the moment. So often you're shown images like this, and remember we're, we're looking at an icon here, so it's, it's teaching you something. Um, and the idea is that in order for evolution to work, evolution is a change in a population over time. It's often defined simply as a change in allele frequency in a population, which is a, a very techy and minimalist way to say it, that actually I wouldn't argue with in terms of that is the thing that actually happens. Allele frequencies do change, populations, genetics change. If the roof caved in on half of us right now, the allele frequency in the population would change because half the alleles would be gone. But that's not evolution, right? So we have to look at it a little bit more. You know, how is this going to get us from molecules to a man? So the idea is that natural variation plus natural selection is going to give us changes in population over time. So every species is going to produce uh, more individuals than can survive. And we're very grateful for this when it comes to things like mosquitoes and locusts because if all of them grew up to adulthood, we would be very sad. Um, and within any population, there is natural variation. There are characteristics that differ. Um, some mosquitoes are, I guess, you know, better able to bite people than others. Um, and so there's competition for resources that are available. Um, if I'm outside, they'll, they'll all sit on me, so that's good competition in your favor. Um, but it's, it's another, another way of looking at that sort of you know, variation in population. I'm particularly susceptible to mosquitoes. If there's a mosquito-borne illness going around, I'm more likely to get it, so I'm more likely to die. Um, and less likely to pass on my genes to the next generation. So adaptation then occurs when the individuals with the best variations basically outcompete the other individuals in terms of reproduction. So it comes down to differential reproduction. Who has the most kids? So Catholics were doing great. Um, and, uh, and then, and, and then you, know, you end up with a population that's changed over time. So if you look at this picture, this picture is trying to show you how natural selection works, and it's doing a pretty good job of showing you how natural selection works. But most people miss something when they look at images like this. And if you look at the starting population and the ending population, you have a very diverse population of giraffe coat colors, and then you have a very uniform population of giraffe coat colors. And if you guys know anything about monocultures, um, the more genetically similar individuals are, the less resistant they are to diseases and things like that. And so we're already seeing a problem even in this standard image that's being used to present evolution as true, which is that natural selection um, is a winnowing process. It gets rid of things. It can't really create anything. So you also need mutations. Mutations have to be the mechanism for evolution because evolution requires increasing genetic variation. If we just had natural selection all the time, we'd select down to a very tiny population and then that population would go extinct the next time the environment changed in a way that wasn't favorable to it. So you have to have new genetic variation. The only currently identifiable source of new variation is mutation. Now, that's leaving aside things like homologous recombination, which are just rearrangements of genetic information that already exists so that you can get traits in your, in your children that maybe haven't shown up since the grandparents. Um, but that's not new information. 
And that's information just being rearranged and, and being expressed versus being non-expressed. So the only way to get new genetic information is mutation. Therefore, mutations have to be the key mechanism of evolution. Now, if I can show you conclusively that they're not, I've kind of hit a home run here. So let's see how I do. Um, so if you can think of, you know, I, I'm going to be using words like genome and base pair and nucleotide, which are all pretty foreign to us. And as I spoke in the last talk about the idea of knowledge, we're going to build on something that we know, which in this case is going to be an analogy so that we can better understand something that's very foreign to our everyday experience. So you can think of the genetic information in an organism as an instruction manual. And the, the genome, so for example, um, in this case, the genome is all the genetic information that we need to build a giraffe. And if you were going to look at this genetic information, you'd have to look at 10 letters every second for 40 hours a week for 68 years to actually view all of the information it takes to build a giraffe. So that's just kind of to give you a mental image. That's about 2.8 billion um, nucleotides. And it, if a nucleotide is basically, a nucleotide or a base pair is basically a letter in the instruction manual for the giraffe. So you can think of the genome as the manual and the nucleotide as a letter. So when I talk about those things, right? So what happens over time is that you get changes in the manual. You get some nucleotides that, that, turn, that are changed into different nucleotides. So you get a different sequence. You get a different sentence or a different paragraph. And you can think of a paragraph as a gene, right? Or, or some sort of um, regulatory region. And you accumulate more and more and more mutations over time. Natural selection does its magic, and you get a better giraffe. <laughs> so that's how this is supposed to work. Think about the way that, that uh, changes, random changes, would affect, would affect, say, a Shakespeare play. If I'm just randomly adding 100 typos, and then I pass it along to you, and you randomly add 100 typos, and you pass it along to somebody else, and they randomly add 100 typos. Over time, those mistakes add up, right? And this is actually what happens when an organism reproduces. So every giraffe, since they didn't build the printing press, has to painstakingly cite, er, copy the entire instruction manual to, to uh, build a new giraffe, to build a baby giraffe. So every time a giraffe copies its instruction manual, it makes about 100 mistakes. It passes those along to its offspring, who pass, who make their own 100 mistakes, and they pass 200 mistakes along to their offspring, who make their own 100 mistakes, who pass 300 mistakes along to their offspring. You see where I'm going with this? So over time, as mutations accumulate, you don't get a better giraffe, you get a dead giraffe. <clears throat> and that's my contention. So why, why am I contending that? Well, there's basically four things that need to be true, and this is a little bit in a certain sense, a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, in another sense, it's pretty accurate. Um, but it's, it's a basic way to think about this and explain it. So we're going to look at it in terms of how, what would have to be true for mutations to be the mechanism of evolution. And if those things aren't true, we can reasonably conclude that they are not increasing genetic information. And I'll show you that they're actually decreasing. So. Um, because mutations cause a change in the instruction manual and that change is random, it would be very helpful if most of the instruction manual didn't really matter. Because if I make a bunch of random changes in information that matters, very quickly I'm going to degrade necessary information in the genome. But if most of it is useless, um, this is where we get the term junk DNA, then it really shouldn't matter if I have a high mutation rate. Most of the changes that accumulate should also be fairly neutral. They should be harmless. Because if I'm accumulating negative mutations, if I'm accumulating 100 negative mutations a generation, I'm going to have a problem. And 100 mutations a generation is actually the, the actual recorded mutation rate in human beings. So I'm not just kind of throwing numbers out there. Most of the changes should be harmless, but some of them have to be good, because otherwise I can't kind of go up the evolutionary ladders, where I can't go from goo to you. <laughs> You're a little more complicated than goo. Um, far more complicated than a microbe. And 
when I accumulate these random changes, these mutations, they have to lead to totally new instruction manuals, so totally new kinds of animals. So a giraffe with wings is just one example. Um, but if we're going from a fish to a reptile, we have to have a lot of new information on how to live on dry land, how to have lungs, how to, you know, uh, not, um, how to deal with the fact that the pressure in the atmosphere is much less than the pressure you'd experience under water, things like that. So I have to have new instruction manuals. So for mutations to really be a mechanism of evolution as we understand it from microbes to men, most of the instruction manuals should be useless, most of the changes should be harmless, some of them should be good, and I have to get new kinds of animals as I accumulate mutations. So let's look at the first one. How much DNA is junk? Well, the concept of junk DNA originated in the 1960s, and it was basically kind of um, came into the literature with Susama Ono in the 70s, and he theorized that most of the genome has to be junk, because at the time they didn't understand how, mu how high mutation rates were in the, in the 50s uh, and 60s, and when they started learning that they're very high, you know, for, for us as many as 100 per generation that are actually getting passed on to our offspring, that's not the mutations I'm accumulating. I've got way more mutations than that in my body. That's just the ones that I'm gonna pass down to the next generation that occur in the, in the gametes. Um, so once they realized that mutation rates are really high, he said, well, the DNA has to be junk because evolution is true, right? Starting from that premise. So most of the DNA has to be junk because otherwise I couldn't have this many mutations and still have a living organism over millions and millions and millions of years. And then that idea was cemented in popular imagination when the Human Genome Project was done. So I worked for a little while at WashU um, in St. Louis where they did the Human Genome Project, but I was working a little bit after that project was completed. So that was sitting with the, the finishers, the guys who were doing the computer programming, trying to line up all the, all the base pairs right, and I was, I was playing with platypus DNA. Um, but once, uh, once we sequenced um, the genome, and re we realized that only about 2% of your DNA is genes, then the junk DNA idea really got stuck in kind of the popular imagination. So, so what's a gene? Well, you can think of a gene, as I said before, as sort of a paragraph in that instruction manual. It's a, it's a specific and a relatively short region of DNA that codes for a protein. And unlike most of my high school students think, proteins are not actually for energy. Proteins are for everything but. So if you need to build something in your body, it's gonna involve proteins. If you need to move something in your body, it's gonna involve proteins. If you need to protect your body through your immune system, it involves proteins. Um, hormones, some hormones are proteins. Um, proteins are used to, to store molecules. Proteins are used to, to do chemical reactions. So at a molecular level, everything in your body gets done by a protein. So scientists thought initially, well, if I know all the protein coding sequences, then I know all the important stuff, right? But I'm gonna use another analogy here that might be helpful. If I handed you a box of lab equipment, could you teach a chemistry class? Probably not. But you've got all the important stuff, but you don't know when to use it, right? Or how to use it, or how much of it should be used, or you know which of it should be used together. So really, the genes are important, and without them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't function very well. But what's even more important is the regulation of the genes. How much of that protein do I produce? When do I produce it? Where do I produce it? You know, and you can, you can know this if you think about your own body, right? If your eye started producing liver proteins, you wouldn't be able to see, and it would be a really big problem. And if your skin started producing proteins that it shouldn't, you know, and then it, it, it wasn't the, the impermeable barrier to the outside that it is, you'd have some problems. So you are able to be a complicated multicellular organism because of things that aren't genes. All of the information in your genome that is involved in regulating which genes get turned on when, because all of your DNA is in every cell in your body. So you have to have very precise instructions on how those genes are used. So really, our analogy is actually more complicated than an instruction manual. It's more like an operating system. When things have to get turned on and off at certain times, if all of my programs popped up the instant I opened my computer, I'd have a big problem, right? And if all of your genes were being transcribed or being, uh, being copied at the same time, being made into proteins at the same time, you would have a big problem. 
So we're running into our first problem for evolution, which is that really DNA isn't useless. And we know this theoretically, but do we also know it experimentally? And the answer is yes, we do. So after um, the Human Genome Project was finished, in code started, and this is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, and they assigned at least 80% of human DNA some function. So they're saying instead of 98% junk, maybe it's 20% junk, but there's reasons to believe that that's not actually true, which I'll go into in a second. But the reason they did this is because most DNA is transcribed, which is a $3 word that means you make a copy of it. So if you think about our instruction manual, uh, again, if you had a very rare priceless book in a library, you wouldn't give it to the high schooler who needs a page or two of it for his, his um, history report. You would give him a photocopy of the two pages that he needs. And your DNA basically does the same thing. So when your proteins are being made, I want a copy of the instructions for that protein and only that protein because I don't need all the other proteins at the same time. And then I'm gonna fold the DNA back up and put it away. So if I'm making copies in a library of stuff that doesn't need to be copied, I'm quickly going to be fired because I'm wasting paper and ink and time, right? In a cell, it's actually kind of the same way. If I'm wasting energy and raw materials on making copies of DNA that I'm not using, that is not advantageous. There's no reason why natural selection would preserve that, especially on such a massive scale. So the fact that DNA is transcribed means not just to me, but also to an evolutionist that it's useful. And the other reason is that a surprising amount of DNA is conserved, and that means that it's the same across multiple different species. And when DNA is the same across multiple different species, um, an evolutionist will look at that and tell you that it's evidence of common ancestry, but they do that because it's evidence that that, that particular area is extremely functional. And I can't change it that much because if I changed it that much, the organism would die. So these two things very much indicate that DNA is functional, but it doesn't stop there. So when we're talking about transcription, um, you're making a copy of your DNA. DNA is anti-parallel, so it runs, there's two strands and they run in opposite directions. So at least a quarter of your entire genome is transcribed both ways. That means it's not only useful reading it in this direction, it's useful reading it in that direction. And I'll give you another analogy, forgive my super done creative sentences here, but they sort of make sense, right? So strap on no pets, if you read it backwards, is step on no parts. So I've got an English sentence, sort of, that means something different backwards and forwards. And this is what's happening in your DNA. It means something different when you go one way versus when you go the other way. Now, I'm gonna make a mutation in this. Now it says drop on no pots and stop on no parts. I've completely altered the meaning of both sentences. So this makes mutating an area of the DNA that is transcribed in both directions doubly bad for you. So it puts even more constraints on what kind of mutations could be harmless, which is the next question we're gonna to get to. Okay, and it turns out that as we research more and more and more, all the things that scientists thought were junk are actually useful. So pseudogenes are something they throw out a lot. These are things that look like genes but aren't. Um, they're actually incredibly involved in regulating that whole process of what genes get made when and where, which is called gene expression. Um, so they're not useless. They are actually, they have a function, it's just not the same as a gene. They said, well, okay, well, regions between the genes are, are useless. Well, no, that's where you have the promoters, which tell you when to start transcribing something, and the repressors, which tell you to not transcribe something, and the nucleosome binding sites that are pictured up here. The, the DNA is, um, if you took all the DNA in one of your cells and put it out in a string, it would be slightly taller than me, and all that fits in a cell. And it's very long and very thin. And so in order to fit it in the cell, it has to be wrapped up around certain proteins called histones, and um, they form the nucleosomes. And so you take the part of the DNA you're not using, and you wrap it up really tight, and you take the part of the DNA that gets used sometimes, and you wrap it up kind of loosely so that it doesn't get broken and it doesn't get damaged. And then when you need it, you unwrap it, and then you wrap it back up. So these, these nucleosome binding sites are coded for in the DNA itself. So if I start taking away these sites and I didn't wrap my DNA correctly, I'm gonna have all kinds of problems. I'm gonna have DNA damage, I'm gonna have problems dividing my cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you get the idea. I could go through more terminology, but 
kind of already made my point. So transposable elements, which are sometimes also called jumping genes or selfish genes, um, also have multiple functions, and these include some, some of them are DNA repair. So without DNA repair enzymes, you sustain so much DNA damage in the course of a day that, that you would die very quickly if you didn't have a way to fix it. So this is a very important function. And then repetitive DNA is thought to be useless um, often uh, when, when evolutionary biologists are arguing for useless, uh, uselessness in the genome. But it turns out that one of the most famous instances of repetitive DNA is the telomere. That's a little bit that's at the end of your chromosomes, like a little cap. Because when your chromosomes get copied, the DNA enzymes can't go all the way to the end, so they stop a little bit short. So every time your chromosomes get copied, they go a little, the telomere is a little shorter, a little shorter, a little shorter, a little shorter, until it gets so short that your cells can't divide anymore, and that's when you die. And this is, this is actually thought to be the biological mechanism whereby aging and death occurs. Um, and cancer cells actually override this problem. They have an enzyme called telomerase that, that adds extra to the telomere so they can divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. So this repetitive DNA is actually extremely important, even though it's just kind of repetitive and it doesn't really code, quote, for anything. So how much of your DNA is useless? Well, probably none. <laughs> very, very little. So that brings us to the next question, which is, can you have harmless mutations if all your, inf all your, inst your whole instruction manual is important? Or even if just 80% of it is important, like, like in code claims. So again, I'm going to start with an analogy. Can I have a neutral mutation? Well, if I texted you this, you would probably think that I went to the University of Steubenville, because they say that there a lot. Um, but it is true. Now, if I texted you this, you would probably think I didn't proofread my text messages very well, and you'd be right. I don't. But if I text you this, now you're starting to think that I'm explaining to you in very broken English that I understood what you just said, and I'm not actually making a comment about God at all. So I took two mutations that were harmless by themselves. If I texted you either of these things, God, God it good, or God is good, you would probably have gotten my original message, God is good. But when I put them together, I completely obscured the message. So this becomes a problem. So even if mutations don't damage a huge amount of information, if, I'm, if I have 100 and then I, my children add 100 and their children add 100 and their children add 100 of these very slightly bad for you mutations, and they're going to be slightly bad for you if all that information is useful, then you get rapid decay over time. So some people might raise an objection to this and say, wait a minute, what about silent mutations? Okay, so a silent mutation is a mutation that doesn't cause a change in the protein sequence. It changes the DNA sequence, but it doesn't change the protein sequence that it codes for. Well, how is that? Well, DNA codes for amino acids in three, um, three nucleotide codons um, is the word for it. So the last, the last nucleotide in that sequence of three can often be substituted, and it will code for the same amino acid, the same little building block in the protein. So in this, in this image, you've, you've got um, the original sequence is TTC, and the mutation is TTT, but both of those uh, sequences of three code for lysine, so I don't have any change in the protein. So surely at least these mutations must be harmless, right? And it's always assumed that they were, because they're not causing any change in the protein. But they do actually alter the regulation of the gene, because of something called codon bias. So in an, in an organism, they might have a lot of, of ability to match that TTC codon, but only a little bit of ability to match that TTT codon with the right amino acid. So some scientists recently published an article in Nature, it was just last year, and Nature and Science are the two, I, I call them the Bibles of biology, um, because if you get published in those journals, that is, that is the absolute top-notch research that's being presented, so this is, this is um, very good research. They looked at 8,341 yeast mutants with mutations in 21 different genes, which is a very high end value, so we can have a pretty high confidence in their conclusions because they're looking at a lot of data. And they reported that 76% of silent mutations were bad enough for the organism that they slowed the growth rate measurably. So the clearest data we have shows us that even the mutations that we would theoretically think are harmless are bad for the organism at least three quarters of the time. They're bad enough that we can measure how bad they are in the laboratory. 
So do we have harmless mutations? Do we have neutral mutations? Um, I would argue that we don't, along with Dr. John Sanford. Um, and he, he says that there, basically there are no neutral nucleotide sites. There's no sites that you can change in the genome without damaging the, the instruction manual. Because the very fact that it exists, a nucleotide is going to affect spacing between other nucleotides, which is going to change things about gene expression. It's going to slow it down or speed it up. It's going to affect um, regional nucleotide composition. It affects how sticky those two pieces of DNR, DNA are, because you have to pull them apart to make a copy. So if they stick harder, you're going to make slower copies. If they stick less, you're going to make faster copies. That's going to change how much protein gets expressed. It affects the way the DNA folds around those, those histone proteins I talked about earlier. It affects the way that the copies of the DNA fold. So RNA is the copy of the DNA. If I make a copy and it folds over on itself in certain ways, it's just going to get destroyed. And they also affect the, um, the nucleoside binding, like I said before. So if a nucleotide were to carry absolutely no information, it would be by definition slightly bad for you because it's going to slow cell replication, it's going to slow cell division, and it's going to waste energy. So between the data I presented for the last question and the data I presented for this question, we can reasonably conclude that the entire instruction manual is useful and any changes, even small ones, are going to be bad for that instruction manual. They're not going to lead to giraffes with wings, they're going to lead to worse off giraffes. So can we rescue evolution with good mutations? Well, according to Richard Linsky, who is famous for starting a very long-term E. coli uh, evolution experiment in 1998, he says that perhaps one in a million mutations are good. And based on the information I've already presented to you, that means that 999,999 of them are bad. So if I'm losing $999,000 for every one that I gain, I'm going to go bankrupt very quickly. All right? And this is not necessarily in an individual, because remember, an individual is accumulating 100 mutations per, mutation, per generation. This is going to take a lot of individuals to get a good mutation, if Linsky is right. But is Linsky right? Well, um, Linsky had bacteria that he was looking at in the laboratory in a very tightly controlled environment where they're always eating the same thing and they always have the same moisture content and they always have the same amount of light and they always have the same amount of aeration and they're roughly at the same temperature, maybe slightly variation when you take them in and out of the, uh, out of the um, incubator. But if you have bacteria that, that are existing in normal natural environments, those things are going to be changing even in the course of a day. You know, think about part of your yard that's shaded in the morning and it's in the sun in the afternoon. There's a dramatic temperature difference and moisture difference. You know, the dew evaporates, the dew comes back. You have fluctuations throughout in the environment throughout the day. Bacteria need to be able to survive that, and they're single cells, so they need all the information that they they uh, require to survive all contained within them. So they have a lot of just-in-case genes. Genes that only need to get activated under certain circumstances. Well, if I put you in a constant, unchanging environment, you don't need those genes. So remember what I just said about if a nucleotide is just kind of taking up space, it's bad for you? So those genes now then become detrimental to the bacteria because they have to copy them and, and they're, they're transcribing them and they're making, maybe making proteins. And if they stop doing that, well, then they're going to grow faster. So a lot of these cases where you see these, these um, beneficial mutations in the laboratory, what you're seeing is, is a gene that would normally function in the environment is getting broken. And that's, it's kind of like stripping down a car for a race. You know, technically I wouldn't need the air conditioning, but if I took it out, I'd have a little bit weight, less you know, weight on the car and it might go a little bit faster in a race. But that doesn't mean I've improved the car. Right. So this is a quote from Dr. John Sanford's genetic interview book, which basically was saying just what I was saying, but he's a doctor and I'm not. So, um, But lest, lest you know, anyone think I'm just selectively looking at creationist sources, here's some evolutionists saying basically the same thing. Um, and they say uh, you know, that beneficial mutations are, can be detected in, when you look in the laboratory in these evolution experiments. But you could argue that the detection of these beneficial mutations represent fitness effects of, they call them extremely maladapted populations. Um, maladapted means you're not going to survive very long in the wild. A chihuahua is fairly mal maladapted, um, especially if you take them to, to Alaska. Um, they won't make it. Um, 
And then these, these beneficial mutations are important only in the artificial environment of the lab. So it's not just Dr. Sanford who's pointing this out. This is known in, in the evolution community as well. It's very difficult to translate something that's happening in the lab to something that's happening in real life. So in the lab, you can maybe get one in a million beneficial mutations. What about real life? Well, nearly every health policy that we have in place is designed to reduce mutations, not increase them. So you don't want to be exposed to radiation and you don't want to consume carcinogens. Well, why not? Well, because mutations aren't good for you. If they were, we would all be rushing out to you know, wear uranium makeup. Um, and you know, just to kind of put it in perspective, you know, any time that you think about mutations, you know, what do you think about? You might think about cancer, you might think about diabetes, you might think about Marfan syndrome, things like that. There are as many as 10,000 different disorders in humans that are caused by a single a mutation in a single gene. Um, where are the 10,000 benefits in humans that are caused by mutations in genes? Now, there's a couple of things that are argued as beneficial in humans, but it's really easy to debunk those. All you have to do is type in the, the gene in question and um, something like negative effects, and you'll immediately get uh, a whole bunch of hits back. And I'm gonna look at a, a couple of specific ones that are claimed to be beneficial here in a second, but one of the ones I didn't include in the slides is it's a common mutation that's supposed to make you resistant to HIV, which you think is positive in areas where you might be exposed to HIV, right? But um, it also causes uh, serious problems with your liver, and if you have MS, it can lead to early death. So. Is it good for you, or is it not good for you? Well, if I if I you know get exposed to the HIV virus, then maybe I'll have a better chance of surviving. But I'm not very likely to get exposed to that virus, and I'm very likely to have liver problems if I have this mutation. So it's they're not good for you, um, even when they're claimed to be beneficial. And that's actually what we're going to go into into right now. So one of the objections raised to this idea that there aren't beneficial mutations is antibiotic resistance. So I'm sure you've all heard of MRSA which is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. If you're in the hospital, MRSA can be a big, big deal um, because it's resistant to most antibiotics. It's resistant to most antibiotics because of a change in its cell wall. So if you think of the cell wall as sort of a scaffolding around the cell, if I was to build a scaffolding, I would very much want my corners to be square, right? Because that would be the strongest way to build a wall. I wouldn't want them to kind of be wonky, right? The antibiotic methicillin can bind to the square scaffolding, but it can't bind to the wonky scaffolding. So if I build my scaffolding wonky, the methicillin won't kill me. But if I then come into an environment where there's other bacteria that have non-wonky scaffolding around their cells, natural selection eliminates me because I don't grow and replicate fast enough. So if you put MRSA in a test tube with regular Staph aureus that's not resistant to the antibiotic, and there's no antibiotic in there, very, very rapidly the MRSA goes extinct because it simply can't compete because its cell wall is not, is not um, strong enough. So it damages the integrity of the cell, it slows the replication of the bacteria, and over time, Staph, Staph aureus outcompetes it. So is this a good mutation? only in the presence of methicillin, not in regular life. So I call this a spork problem. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't get something for nothing, even in mutations. Um, whenever you have a gain in one area, you're going to have a loss in another area, and anybody who's tried to eat spaghetti with a spork understands exactly what I'm talking about. Or spoon, or, or um, sorry, soup with a spork. So a couple other objections that can be raised. One is tusklessness in elephants. This is a particularly egregious one. If you go online, there's a, um, there's a, I can't remember the name of the channel, but it's somebody who thinks he's a hotshot in biology trying to explain why genetic entropy is stupid. And um, aside from the usual objection of just calling Dr. Sanford a liar, which is not particularly convincing, um, he points out that, well, there's these beneficial mutations, and one of them is tusklessness in elephants. So if an elephant doesn't have any tusks, that will be protective to the elephant. The elephant will live longer because it won't be poached for its tusks, is the argument. So I looked it up. And it turns out that the tuskless mutation is paired with a lethal X-linked recessive gene. And this means two things. It means that only females are tuskless, which is actually really bad for the population because now only males are going to get poached. 
and you're rapidly going to have a population where you have um, not enough males to have sufficient outbreeding and you're going to have uh, genetic error catastrophe like you have in endangered species. So that's a problem. And the other problem is that half the male baby elephants that are conceived are not viable. They die uh, in utero, which makes tuskless mothers about 67% as fertile as their unmutated counterparts. Um, so you're not, you're simply, they're not going to have the number of offspring. So if you take an endangered population and you cause them to have fewer offspring, you're going to accelerate them towards extinction. This is not a beneficial mutation when you look at real life. When you look at a very specific set of circumstances, you can say, oh look, it's good for the elephants. But that very specific set of circumstances doesn't actually determine the fate of most elephants. So you can't argue that this is good, especially when it's connected with something that's lethal. All right? Is sickle cell trait beneficial? This is one that gets argued a lot in humans because having one copy of the sickle cell allele protects you against malaria. And then it confers a survival rate of 86% versus 84%, which is, it doesn't seem as significant as, as it actually is, but a 2% increase in survival can be pretty significant if you're extremely likely to be exposed to the disease. So this is good, right? Well, if you have two copies of the sickle cell allele, you have a 90% chance of never reaching adulthood. If you have one copy and your spouse has one copy, you have a 25% chance every time you get pregnant that your child won't live to be an adult. Is that good? And even if you have one copy, it's bad for you under certain conditions, like heavy exercise, dehydration, or high altitude. Is this a good mutation? No, this is an explanation of how sometimes a really bad for you mutation can get fixed in a population because certain circumstances allow it to persist when normally it would die out. And, you know, I, I'm not one who likes to throw around hot button words, but it seems to me very odd that it's a bunch of professors, probably mainly white guys, talking about something being beneficial that primarily affects African populations by killing their children. So while we're talking about um, beneficial mutations, we have to talk about the question of new information. So an evolutionist will argue that, of course, a mutation creates new information because you've had a change and you've got information that wasn't there before. And so we'll go back to our analogy. That's like saying I've gone from God is good to God it good. But the kind of information that you need, new information you need to go from a microbe to a man, is more like going from God is good to the sixth question of the Summa times two. So when somebody claims that there is new information, if you find a tiny amount of information that's altered, yes, technically it's new, but you're not actually adding anything to the information that's there. Evolution doesn't have a way to go from God is good to the sixth question of the Summa. And the best that they have currently um, is uh, the evolution of the EBG genes. So again, we're going to give them the benefit of doubt. We're going to look at the absolute best example they have and see how good it is. So Dr. Barry Hall um, knocked out the ability of E. coli to produce the enzyme lactase, which basically means it cannot um, digest the sugar lactose, which you're familiar with from milk products, right? Um, and knocking out the ability just means he's gone and genetically altered it, so it can't produce this enzyme, it can't eat the sugar. And then he put it on lactose-only media to see if anything would evolve the ability to, to um, produce lactose. And he found mutants much, much, much more rapidly than he expected, which is actually a bad sign, as we'll see here in a minute. So the ability for the mutated bacteria to, to use the lactose sugar to survive came from a protein that's called EBGA. So Dr. Hall went back and he isolated the original unmutated protein, which he called EBGO. And he looked at it in a test tube. And when he put this in the test tube, the enzyme was able to break down lactose. So the unmutated, unevolved enzyme already possessed the ability to metabolize lactose. Do you see a problem here? Oops, sorry. So if I have a pre-existing ability to metabolize lactose, and now I'm metabolizing lactose, do I have new information? Clearly not. Now, in a certain sense, I do have a new ability because now I can metabolize lactose fast enough 
for the organism to survive because before it couldn't, now it can. Well, why did that happen? Probably, and um, uh, I had a really hard time finding how the actual original gene is regulated because nobody's actually looking at that. So what happened is most likely that the regulation of that original gene was in some way broken so that now I can express it all the time and then I can I produce enough of it to actually break down enough lactose to live. But this is sort of like saying I've improved my, my car by um, hot wiring it so that the light is on in the car all the time. Because it's really, really helpful when, you know, I need to find my keys in the dark. Um, and it is. And that's saved me once or twice <laughs> to have that light on. You know, but I don't want it on all the time because it's not, it's not good in other instances where it's running out my battery. You know, you don't want to be making an enzyme all the time that isn't actually helpful. So he actually looked, Dr. Hall looked at um, 21 other instances of su supposed new information, new, new evolution of new function in bacteria, and every single time it involved a gene that either had a pre-existing function or a function that was so similar to the other function on a molecular level that, that they were almost indistinguishable, or a, a, an off switch that was broken, or an on switch that was broken, or something to that effect. There was never actually an instance of new information. And his own, his own analysis of his experiment, I'll translate it for you here in regular English, um, you know, he said all the new functions that evolved for this enzyme that we looked at represent variations upon the general function of breaking down a particular kind of sugar, which is a function that it already had. So the unmutated enzyme doesn't, have, doesn't break down any of the sugars that we tested it with at rates that are fast enough for E. coli to survive, but it breaks them all down when we test them in vitro. So we've changed something about the regulation of this gene. We haven't actually changed a new gene. We haven't given it new information. So thus, in a real sense, the point mutations that generate the evolved enzymes do not result in truly new activities. They simply improve old functions. Well, if that's all I've got, and uh, by the way, this was done in the 1970s, and it was still referenced in 2008 in Finding Darwin's God as the best example of new information that we have in evolution. So we're not generating new information. We're not finding beneficial mutations that are truly beneficial. We don't have harmless mutations, so the genomes are degrading over time, so could we, could we maybe finally rescue this? with mutations somehow accumulating to create new kinds of organisms, and I bet you know the answer already. <laughs> okay, so you might meet people who argue that there are a number of new species that have, have quote-unquote evolved. Ask them to show you a paper that documents that, and I bet they won't be able to. So there, it's very easy to say, oh, we know a bunch of species have evolved, but when you say show me one and they can't show you one, that's a problem. So. They certainly can't show you that the evolution of a new genus. So when you think about you know, those categories of living organisms we talked about a little bit ago, you have the very great big categories, the phyla that we were talking about earlier, so all vertebrates are in the same phyla. When you get down to genus, um, you have a much, much, much smaller category. So family, like all the, all the things that look like dogs are in the family Canidae, but a fox is in a different genus from a dog, right? So basically what we're saying is you couldn't even take a snow leopard and produce an ocelot. Nothing like that has ever been observed. No evolution of new genera has been observed. So if they can't show me a new genus, I don't know why I'm supposed to believe them about a new kingdom or a new phylum or anything more uh, broad than that. Right? So we would say um, that these kinds of things sort of fall within the same kind of animal, right? So a cat is going to give rise to a cat, a dog is going to give rise to a dog, a bacteria is going to give rise to a bacteria, a pepper moth is going to give rise to a pepper moth. So often when people object to, um, to me saying that evolution doesn't create new kinds, they'll point to something like the pepper moth and say, well, there was this experiment that Kettlewell did in England and he saw that, that there were darker moths and they were, they were more common after, after London got polluted. And I would start by telling them that Kettlewell would fail in my high school research methods class because of the poor methods that he used in his experiment, like taking the moths, which are normally active at night, and warming them 
them up over the hood of his car first thing in the morning to get them to move at all so that he could put them outside in the morning because that's when he was doing his work. And he would just set them on the um, side of a tree and birds would come and pick them off like it was a feeding tray. And so of course he recovered uh, more dark moths than he recovered um, peppered moths. And uh, the natural predator of peppered moths, by the way, is bats. Um, who don't see in the dark anyway. But all that aside, you know, people hold this up and say, well, this is an example of evolution. But this slide should actually be titled, not is speciation a good example of evolution, but is this even an example of speciation? I went from a peppered moth to a peppered moth. And if you remember our biological definition of species from earlier, any a population of individuals that can interbreed constitutes a species. So I have, uh, I have talked three minutes over my time, but I've made all four of my points. So when we look at mutations being a mechanism for evolution, there simply is no room in the genome for the kind of changes that would have to occur to create a new kind of animal from an old kind of animal. And this is even granting the evolutionists that we somehow got to the first cell in the first place. And as hard as this is to believe from you know, looking at all the stuff that we look at in regular popular culture, getting to that first cell is more impossible than everything I just explained to you. And if you'd really like to read up on that, that's, uh, there's a really good book called The Stairway to Life by Change Laura Tan and Rob Statler. And they explain, uh, basically go through 12 different steps that you would have to, to go through to get from chemicals to a living cell and explain how absolutely impossible all of them are. So I'm even granting that we already got to the first cell. We can't get from the first cell to all the things that we see. So um, I don't even really need to give my third presentation, but I'll give it anyway because it might have some interesting stuff going on in it. So that's, that's that.